biliriz, biliriz. Demin de söyledi. I want to tell you the, the two stories I want to tell you about Minecraft, which was amazing. It's actually more than one story. So you must excuse me for this. But it's our oh, James Small. James Small is a legend. Okay, I'm going to tell you two stories about James Small. Okay, and you must be very wise about printing these, but but you can print them. The one story about James is that uh, he went out with a friend of mine on uh, it was a Thursday evening. Okay, <laughs> my friend told me yesterday I had a big job. When she like parked the car over a pavement and he tried to get help and he couldn't find help and he says you see he recovered the whole of the slept the whole of uh, the Friday and the Saturday and he says Sunday he was getting up. He says the Monday morning he went for a surf at Landanda and he was cruising all the way back uh, along uh, Sea Point and the next minute James had a house there and he saw James's uh, SLK standing there and James sitting with his head on the steering wheel. And he knocked on the window. <laughs> James looked up, pushed the button for the window to go down, and he looked at him and he says, Where the fuck did you go? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. like so that's James, my friend. And we, that's how we knew and we loved him. He was the most competitive, passionate guy. And uh, yeah, but he was a stout gut, and, and, and like we all are. And, um, and then another, but James was a bit, him and James Dalton are very similar characters to me often because they actually, they were very intelligent guys with this whole rebel thing going for them. But they were actually totally miss, uh, put in the wrong box, you know, and, and they played to it sometimes, but they were, they were flipping passionate, intelligent guys with a bit of a, in the streak of individualism and, and they, didn't, they didn't fit into <laughs> A box, they had a couple of them, you know. And uh, the next minute, old James goes in, in 1996, just before the Tri Nation squad was announced. We had a game against uh, at Ellis Park uh, against the Transvaal side. It was a Curry Cup game, it was played in May, okay. So we finished the Super 12 and we still had enough time to play three Curry Cup games before the Tri Nation squad got announced, okay. Yeah. So the guys today don't understand what workload means. We were we pushed them in Tuesday games, Friday games, set Sunday, it was crazy. And the next minute, uh, we got to, we had, but it wasn't the prettiest of games, and James was a bit under the belt telling some of the guys uh, he likes their mothers and their, their girlfriends, you know, and, and, and Henny LaRue still rucked his hand, and James still sat with the thing on his hand saying, Oh, if you're looking for trouble. But that Sunday, and I think Brendan, you probably wrote this article, you, it was uh, saying, uh, 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 Yopi Mulder, uh, uh, Henny LaRue, and saying, I know who the other guy was, they refused to play with. James Small because of his attitude and what he said to them on the field, okay, but it was, it was below the belt, he was, he was big, James was being the best part of James, and so we're sitting there, the, the hotel guys flew up, up, sitting there at the hotel, that Crown Plaza there in Sunnyside, and we're sitting there, and uh, James is in his room, and he's got his, uh, his uh, next to him, his, his uh, old cigarette, full of cigarettes, smoking, and, you know, and, and then watching TV, and next one, his phone rings, and myself and Juba was there. And, yeah, it's under Mark. James, come to my room. Come to my room. You know, say, okay, guys, see you now. So James gets up, goes to his room. Now we're waiting for him. And he's back about forty-five minutes later. I look at him and say, James, what, what happened? What happened? He says, Ah, oh, you know, guys. Mark looked at me and he told me, You know what, James? I've got your career in the palm of my hand. I can make it. Or I can break it. It's now your choice. What do you want to do about that? You know. So he said, uh, "Yes, yeah, so what do you say, James?" He says, "No, no." I said, "No, coach, I understand. You know, I want to. I'm ready." And so he says, "But you guys know what? He's the fifth Springbok coach that said that to me." <laughs> 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 and if you look before, it was John Williams, it was Ian McIntosh, it was, uh, uh, who was the other one before as well? Uh, it, it, it was Kitsch. And, uh, and all four, it was, it was, it was the fourth Springbok coach that had said that to him. That he's, yeah. he's, and they just show you, coaches come and go, buddy. Trust me, they're the first guys. And, and, but they've got this power thing that they really believe, and they, they're powerful like that. They can make or break you. But but it's the it's the most stupid system ever, and that was James. Yeah, boys, he was the fifth fourth Springbok coach that said that to me, and I think he still went on for three more because he had Carl Duplessis, he had Nick Mallet, and he had 
Who was the other guy that he had? No, he, was really lost. He, he retired on the mallet. He, he, his career yeah, on the mallet. Yeah, yeah. So he had, his, he, had his, he had his six coaches that he, that, that, that he lived through. So never ever as a player should you listen too much to a coach unless it's somebody like a, a, a mental figure, like a guy like Ian McIntosh. That would always, you know, Ian McIntosh was amazing. He would, uh, he would call you in and he'd say, like if I say this earlier, I hear that uh, the receptionist say you don't really greet her that friendly anymore. And what do you think? You too big for your boots now? What's going on? He says, yeah, that's not, there's something wrong. What's going on? Because that's not how we know you. You say, yes, you know what, coach, I miss my girlfriend. Or, or yes, you know, you dropped me. Or what if something happened? And, 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 and he'd have passion for that. But uh, but most coaches just uh, abuse you and use you for as hard as they can and they throw you away. So it takes a special coach to have people afterwards talk, uh, you know, relate to them in that father figure uh, at that stage. That, that was James. Yeah. That that um that series against the All Blacks in '96 was when James actually got dropped. He was left out of the whole series. Just it was actually suspended Locked by Mark Croft. Yeah. For, yeah, for the nightclub, for being out late at night. And I interviewed James after I interviewed you last year for the book. And he told me it wasn't on the, everybody says it was the Friday night. He says it bullshit brew. It was like Wednesday or something. No, it wouldn't get out on the Friday. No, it wouldn't have been the Friday. But that was the sort of legend at the time was that he came in in the morning of the test. And what was the, because I mean, James was a very popular player within the, I mean, a lot of people didn't maybe understand him, but he was a very popular player in the team, certainly with you guys, with, with, with Tash and yourself and with, with Lem and those guys who, who used to playing him and used to have like Natal rules when it came to socializing in those days. Because Ian Mack was very different to Kitch and to Mark Rob. Very different. And, yeah, very, very and different. So, what was the reaction to the squad, to, to, to James, the way he was treated by Mark Rock? Because he basically was dropped after that, 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 that nightclub incident, as, as yes, Brendan yes, calls yes. it. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a big thing, you know. It was hard because, you, you know, it was, it was a bit of bullshit. But, yeah, took him to deal with it and carry on. And, and the interesting thing about James is he, he was always somebody that pushed boundaries. But what people understand, he, he couldn't handle silence because it made him nervous. And when he got nervous, then he then he had to get he had to do things. You know what I'm saying? So, so if he went into his room, there was always a loud TV going. There's always people around him, and and he had his own room because I think he had, he was the most old, and he, he smoked, so he hated being alone. So for him to go out would be uh, you know it, he'd go out with his friends and he'd be awake anyway till late. So so you know and, and then unfortunately it get it get gets pulled out of context at the end of the day, you know. But uh, old James was, uh, you know, the interesting thing about James was that uh, it was, in the Natal setup, we had a very strong forwards and we had very strong backline guys. And, and you had uh, some really strong individuals. But in those days, uh, the forwards ruled and the backs ruled. Uh, and it's still to, to today, the backs got a little bigger now, so they might be a bit of a tough, tougher fight. But the forwards were, I remember we were playing with Targo, and something was going, so we just couldn't get our rhythm and he's actually taking us out. And James ran in all the way from the wing and he screamed at us for us, he said, just get us the fucking ball now. And John Allen looked at him and he said, you shut the fuck up and get off this field, okay? Pointed him like this. Two minutes later, James was sitting on the sides in the reserve bench and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, and John Allen came afterwards and says, if you ever in your life can speak to us forwards like that, I will fuck you up on that field. you understand me? And James realized he went over a line that he, and when John looked at him like that, he just backed off, you know what I'm saying? Because he realized, now you're going, because he was so competitive. But in that space, that's how the whole squad was, you know what I'm saying? And the best way to treat James was always to make him competitive. And I remember in 1994, we had the Springbok training camps with Kitsch and they still had a race. It was uh, Chris, Chris Barnhorst was in the race, Juba, uh, 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 all the wings were in there. Uh, they even got Oss in there and they had uh, Ruben and Uist. And we, uh, they had to run an 80 meter race. And it was a, it was a race. It wasn't that kids said, you must understand, guys, my wing must have speed. So the, the fastest guys will, will make this team. Yeah. And the Oaks ran. And afterwards, we were flying back. And uh, it was 94 still. And, and the guys looked at, at, at Chris and they said, Chris, how quick is James? He says, Jesus, guys. I was going flat out. He just kept getting faster and faster and faster. So he was a phenomenal athlete and a ball player. You know, he had a feeling for the game. But to channel that energy of his, 
it, 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 it was sometimes it just because it just doesn't stop. If, if we we had, we got him with a soccer ball before before practices, we play like a red ass. If you get red ass, you had to bend over and the give you a slap on the ass, you know something like that. Yeah, he would be down there 45 minutes before training, kicking the ball, kicking the ball, kicking the ball, you know. So he had that incredible intensity about him. And, and that freaked people out a lot. But what was nice with the Natal guys, they were chilled guys. You know, and if, if the guy was like that, he had a good guy with Robert Dupree, even Robert, which was like a mental figure to him. And uh, and, and in the squad itself, his, his personality wasn't, there was a lot of big personalities, but but Mac managed to keep everybody together, like as a type of father figure. And... Uh, you know, those days, Mac, I, I spoke to him the other day. He, he still had the video video recorder. So he had two recorders. Then he'd tape the games and he'd get it. So we pitch up at the one video session. <laughs> He's got these tape recorders. But it's a mission in those days to get these things. And it's, yeah. you know, it, it's just a whole thing. So Mac taught himself how to videotape the games and edit it for us with video machines. So any technical anal anal analyst today must just shut up because they don't understand how old Mac had to do that. So he pitches up and he doesn't want to make these meetings too long because we go to the game. So we see these two remotes. So we take the one remote. And we give it to Mac, but we got the real remote in Dick Mir's hands. <laughs> so Mac goes, he says, okay, guys, I just want to show you, I just want to forward this, forward, and he's looking at it. He's but I'm pressing forward. Oh, okay, okay, this is going, no, no, stop, 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 stop. So Dick is sitting behind him playing with the remote, and Mac is going up shit because I had this thing right, I had this thing. I forward it forward, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> He'd press the buttons and the whole team would be screaming with laughter. He'd say, hey, Mac, Mac, sorry, man, here's the right remote. And he'd look at it and he'd say, you prick, man, how can you do this to me? Yeah, and the guys would laugh. And he'd say, okay, guys, now you focus, you know. And the guys would have the respect to push him to a point. But but there was amazing respect uh, between Mac and the players. And uh, I must be honest with a guy like Kitchen Minecraft as well. There was always a, a lot of respect as a as, a, old, uh, as a, uh, a trusted figure. You know what I'm saying? If people are respectful. Another beautiful story of Ian McIntosh is, you know, I had a couple, one of the, the games I'm probably the most proud of, I was the first team to beat the Auckland Blues on their home team, on their home field. They were unbeaten on their home field, them and the Brownbees, for I don't know how long. Yeah. I managed to snap that streak with a shock. So we pitch up with a playing Auckland and the next minute Mac is there. But now we've got... Mark, and we've got injuries, and it's been a long tour, and we we're not, you know, it's just the last, it's our second last game of our last game, and Gary's injured, and now he's got to uh, play Brozzi at eighth man, and, and Vickers van Heerden got sent home, I think, or right, somebody. Yeah, so yeah, so okay. it was just it was just this debacle we've got now. We don't have players, so Mac decided to play Mark at seven flank, bring in Nico Wagner. And now, you, I don't know if you've ever done that thing where they take you, and on a little thing, they draw four dots, and they put one dot out there. And they say, connect the dots, but you're only allowed to use four lines. Okay? Uh -huh. one, have you never seen it? So what happens? You go uh, one, then you go all the way, touch the second dot, but you go all the way to the last dot, and you come back in it. And it, it, the whole thing is to say, to teach you to think outside the box, okay? Because okay. everybody wants to do all the lines in the box. You will yeah. see it's a little, so it allows you, but if you just go outside the box, you can connect them all. Then you make like a big triangle and you've okay. connected them all, you know? So Magna has us as a team, you know, and he's sitting there and we all just, you know, it's been a tough tour. So he has to pick the team now, but now he wants to play Mark at, 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 at seven and, and, and he sits there, okay, guys, he says, guys, I must tell you this thing. But he was always so excited when he came to tell you this. He says, you know what, if you've got these dots, one, two, three, four, and one dot there, connect these dots, but use only four lines. Okay, so we go, you know, Mac, you've got us. So Mac goes, well, you go like this and like this and like this. No, no, fuck, 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 wait, 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 what do you think? <laughs> he puts the five dots down again. He goes, you go this line here, this line here, yeah. He says, no, 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 fuck, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. So he goes, it is for fuck's sake, guys. You just got to think outside the box. <laughs> so he tried to solve his own little puzzle, but he was so excited he forgot how to do it. So you can imagine in that little uh, uh, session how the guys laughed. Because Mac was trying to make this big point and he just couldn't figure out the puzzle that he was asking us. And what we did in that, uh, that night, we actually beat the, the Blues for the first time on their home ground. Yes, and that, that was massive. You know? uh, I think 
Gals was out because he was sick. Robbie came in. Uh, 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 yes, I think I want to say Chris was so was in, and it was just it was a tough tour. And uh, and, and old Mac, yeah, he was always his deep talks was always brilliant. Though. His deep talks were always brilliant. Did you did you play against the Lions in 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 '97? Yes, I played, but just for the for the. Uh, for the shocks, for the shocks, I picked up an injury in 1996, uh, a stress fracture, and then uh, in 1997, I had a funny season. 1997, it was uh, it was just uh, I think I overtrained in the beginning of the year, did a lot of weights. Yes, and I just couldn't get up to four uh, in 97. So 97 was a bit of a, a funny year for me. But uh, another story about Minecraft I wanted to tell you guys is. Uh, Minecraft goes, yes, but this is also, it was in 1996, the end of the year tour. And uh, I was with, uh, with the South African A side, and uh, he goes and he gets the guys together and, and, and he tells the guys, if we beat England, he promises that there would not be one training session before the Wales game. He says he will give them free, a free week off, okay? So the next minute, I think... Uh, we beat England, was, it was still, we beat the French, where Lem still kicked that wet ball and he kicked, uh, he kicked brilliantly. And the next game, he, uh, he, uh, they beat the English. Also, I think US broke down the side and scored a beautiful try. Tough game, and we beat the English. Now, yeah, we go to Wales. I wasn't there, but there's a Gary Teichman told me the story. And he says, the next minute, Markov said, no, he says, and, and, and full credit to Markov, no practice on Monday. He says, and all they were doing is just drinking. <laughs> Okay, just pick one jaw out on that. The next day, Gary calls the guys. Says, "No, no, guys, guys, we can't. We have to play a little bit of touch at least. You know, get a lucky. So they have a lucky session here. Three o'clock, forty-five minutes, hot touch. Go back to the hotel, drink. Like, yeah, Wednesday, come play golf in the pub. Lots of beers. Thursday, Gary calls and says, "Guys, guys, let's just do a bit of lineouts and a bit of scrumming and just, just a bit of touch. You know, just a captain's run." The captain's run, they play well, they play well, the Wales that weekend, but I think it was something crazy, 36-3 or something, they annihilated Wales. That was a good game. And after the game, and, 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 and all credit to Markov, he did it once, tell them, guys, we have to train, he left it for Gary. And the next minute, Gary saw the one line, he's an officer, you know, these guys, they with you the whole week, and the guy was sitting there, but he, says, he saw this guy was like, he had tears in his eyes, looking at his, at his Guinness, just shaking his head, you know, after the team meeting and everything. So Gary goes up to him and he says, yes, uh, I don't know what his name was saying, Mick, but are you all right? And he looks at him and says, no, Gary, I'm not all right. He says, why? He says, you guys come here the whole week. You drink, you play golf, you chase the girls, and then you fuck us up on Saturday. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> and it was amazing. Just, just, showed, just that bit of rest allowed that team to feel so guilty because they knew that they produced that they had one of the best test uh, and, and Mark was willing to do that, you know, and that, that shows you somebody that was in touch with his player. Another great example, in 96, end of the year tour, we had all the contracts with the World Cup and then we had the normal swing box. Then a lot of the World Cup guys just didn't make it again. They just weren't good enough. And it was, you know, some of them had injuries and they struggled to make it. There was a, the Sharks team were coming through, the Lions were going down. And the next minute, uh, um, the, uh, the guys were were uh, uh, having this meeting now because there were more people on the Spring Mock Tour that didn't have contracts than guys that did have contracts, you know. So this wasn't fair because some of the acts were getting paid serious money and these guys were. So they're sitting there and Orion Uber also is still there and he's, uh, you know, he was, oh, big pillow, hot air. Michael was sitting there and says, sorry guys, but, but this is the deal. And, 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 and the next minute, Len puts up his hand. He says, sorry, uh, Andre, uh, would you mind if, uh, if, if I go? Uh, he says, where are you going, Len? He says, no, no, if I leave now, I might just uh, get home with the bathroom before dark and, and, and I've got the car ready for me. So if you excuse me, uh, uh, goodbye and good luck on your tour. And Lem starts getting up. So Matt goes, uh, not Mac, uh, Markov goes, sit down. <laughs> he says, just wait. They walk outside and came back five minutes later with 1.5 million rand for the team. You know? And that was Henry Honeyball. He was the guy. He could have probably got the 1.5 for himself. He was so valuable. But he yeah. never ever worried about it. It was for him to play with his friends under fair conditions. And he just, and he just, and, and when he got, uh, um, uh, when, in 99, 
when Gary got dropped, uh, Lem was crucial for 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 uh, Nick Ballard's plans, and uh, he had an injury and he didn't want to go on, on tour, you know. And he just said, "No, well, Gary's not going. I'm not going because I don't want to play with my friend." You know? okay. And and Ballard threatened him. He says, "I will come for your farm. I will come and I'll fuck you up. You've got a contract. You will play for me." So Lem looked at him and said, "Okay, it's fine. <laughs> I'll go for you." <laughs> And that whole tour, he would just, he would, he would be, not, he wouldn't, he, he, he trained hard, he did everything what he had to do, but he just, you could just see, he wasn't going to, he played because he loved playing with his friends. And uh, his friend got treated badly and he didn't want to play in that team anymore. It was amazing. Huh? And, uh, and that was the value of a guy like Lem. He, 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 there was many rumors of other guys that got offered serious monies behind, and I know they got paid that. And he was willing to fight for it. And funny enough, Mark Andrews as well. He's another guy that was willing to fight for the guys that, that, that because he said, as a team, we decided this. And they always tried to split you. So you had the main guys and the captains here talking. And then they would oh, give them offers behind their back, you know, that the people would know about. And, and, and Lem and, and Mark Andrews were two guys that said, no, this is what we agreed upon. We will give that. And it made them very unliked by the, by the, by the, um, by the, by the administrators, you know, because they were good enough to do it. But unfortunately, then as soon as you, your level of play drops and the big knives come out, it, 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 it doesn't work too well anymore. You, 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 were, you were, had that whole super sub experience in the 1998. Was that, was that the first time the super sub started coming through when yourself and Bob, I mean, you talk about, what was it, Spark Pillow or whatever. Um, I don't know, you were, you were much... You were much, you were much more than that by 1998, and and you were part of that whole sort of mallet winning run, 18 tests, because you you didn't play under Coral, obviously, if you didn't play against the Lions and that. Yeah. So yeah, so you so you played you played in the mallet, and and Mark Andrews says that he was the best coach that that he ever had for that year, and then it was so disappointing because later on, when you guys could probably have gone on to win the World Cup in 99 because you were so good. And at the end of 1998, you were so good. But in 1999, I mean, that was your big opportunity to win a World Cup because you, you'd missed out in 95. I mean, how disappointing was that? And how disappointing was the way Nick sort of maybe lost it a bit? No, it's, it's actually, it's, it's a long answer because what happened at the end of 98, that's where all the bullshit started. We had this incredible 98 experience where we really played some of the best rugby. And where I became a super sub, and it's also, yeah, people hate it when I say that. I get so pissed off when people look at you, but I, four Springbok coaches, four, I was thinking that, four, yeah. said, you're by far our best player. And that's what some of the people that you guys describe as legends, the best that's ever played, okay? Yeah. They told me, you're by far our best player, but I don't need you for that eight year I need you for the last 30. So if I can bring you on with that 30 being fresh, and I got a lot of resistance, especially in 99, because it, you know, Aus didn't like that. But then we had statistics after the England game where I hit 17 rucks and made nine tackles, and he, he made seven tackles and hit 19 rucks. In, uh, he played 50 minutes and I played 30. And Ian Macken, and, and, and that's where Nick Manager said, if any fucking ever comes to me again and tell me that substitutions doesn't work, Shut up, because look at these stats. And then, then, it, then the debate was over. But where it came from was with the Sharks. So what would happen? Mac would have myself, Robbie Kempson, and Adrian Garvey. Okay? But I could play hooker as well. So he started doing that with us. And then he realized, but yes, it actually works well, because you've got a fresh guy coming on the whole time. And you can play with those, with those rules. And, and we started having big success with that, you know, to be able to get the right, uh, uh, it just brings that, that intent, and the game was definitely going that way, you could see it, and you know, because the holes are open at the end, but you needed to have a good balance inside, you, anybody doesn't make a good impact player, but any good impact player will make a good test player, and people will look at me going, yes, well that's weird, but it really is like that, because it's a special, it's actually an incredible, uh, to get on that field with no Warm up just to get into the field and the intensity you have to play with, you know, it's just and, and you run yourself into a red zone and then you have to recover and you have to do it again. So, so it's not something that anybody can, can just do at it. It's a specific player. That's why you'll see you'll start with beasts, but you very seldom bring him off the bench because he doesn't have a big impact off the bench. But you'll bring a kitch off of the bench because he, he has an impact both ways, you understand. So, and then, uh, uh then in, 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 in 99 when we hit that World Cup. Uh, we had that unfortunate incident where, where, where in 1998, the end of the year, and this is where Solly, Solly unfortunately, uh, uh, he was he was very um, he was 
Nick was a really good coach when he was winning. And he was a very good communicator. That's why people enjoy his video sessions. And he was brutal to the point. You know, it, it look, I remember Percy Montgomery the one day made an excuse for something. It was after we played the Australians in 98 Tri-Nations over there. We just won. And Nick Mallett went off and said, you know, and Percy tried to explain what he was doing. He said, you know what? Sometimes you must just shut up. I didn't say shut up. Shut the fuck up and say, sorry, I was wrong and I'll do better. But these excuses, it just doesn't work for me. You know? And the next minute, Percy made another mistake. And Nick said, Percy, what happened here? He said, sorry, coach. I fucked up. I made a mistake. <laughs> Nick said, yeah, you're a quick learner, you know. You understand? So, so that, was, that, that was Nick's way. He was brutal like that. And then in, in 1998, the end of the year, we went on tour. And we had a good side. Yes, we had a good bench. Franco Smith was on the bench. You know, uh, Bobby was on the bench. I was on the bench. Uh, uh, who was the hooker on the bench at that stage? Uh, I don't know. Who okay. the, it was so James. James was, James was the first James was starting, but then he'd use me as a hooker and, and he'd have a tight deal. Because he never wanted to play me at hooker, but he'd bring me on somewhere else. And so I was always an emergency case, but he'd allow him freedom. And then he made his biggest mistake because uh, he dropped under a fenter for Bobby Skinstad, okay, and, and, and as good as Bobby Skinstad was, and I really believe he could have been, he would have been the natural leader of the, of the uh, 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 Gary to take us from 1999 into the new era for 2003, 2007, and then the next era would have been uh, whoever comes next, you know, and, and unfortunately, they, he was a young guy, never had the players respect, we respected that what he could do, but we never respected him yet, and the same thing happened to me, you have to prove your worth, when we had those contact sessions, Bobby was climbing in, he was there. But then Solly made him this year. Solly started telling the whole world that this guy, he doesn't, doesn't make tackles, he must just play because he's so fantastic. But we don't care how much you can play. We want to see you make the tackles. So, so Solly then started weaving this web of magic about Bobby, 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 Bobby. And then they dropped Andre Fenter for Bobby. Okay, now if you drop Andre Fenter, I don't care what you do, okay? You do not drop Andre Fenter. But why not? Not because he's the best, and the, just because what that had, he will give everything for that team. And yes, and it hurt Andre. I, I was still, uh, I remember I was still on the bench with him, and and uh, he called me and said, "Let's go run some extra fitness upstairs in the one hall that he managed to get keys to." And and we would talk about it. You could see it hurt him that that he, he would give everything for this, and the coach dropped him. And it wasn't so much for him. he just he just he just hated that because he he would give everything. This guy hasn't proven he can do it yet. And then the big mistake we, they made is on that uh, 1998, they picked a guy called Christian Stewart at, 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 yeah. at fly half. And uh, uh, you had a guy like Franco Smith that was going to look at the game he played the All Blacks. Franco Smith turned that game with running flat. He was a very similar to Lem like player uh, running at the line. We had a guy like Christian Stewart. I think I could have run him at that stage. He was a good player, but he was never, ever, and, and he only got in because I think Promise won the. Won the that they, you know, won the curry cup they, they and, and yeah, something and he had to play fly off. So suddenly he Solly made him this incre- and Solly was like that. He would get his team and he would tell them how fantastic he was and the guys would believe him, you know. But yes, but I played against Christian Seal. He wasn't that good. You know what I'm saying? Go play for Canada, my friend. And that when he didn't when he didn't pick Andre and he and he and he and he, and he made um uh, Fran- Franco Smith the players didn't trust what he was doing there because it wasn't the right thing to do yeah sure bring Christian on the bench he's done well but he didn't deserve his place in the team and I still remember we caught a gap against England uh, just outside our 25 and I was running from the side and Peter Miller was jogging next to him he said give me the ball give me the ball and Christian Stewart was running flat out and everybody was just catching him well, if it was if it was what's his name we would have, we would have scored a try but the cover just scored us he just wasn't and and Solly was 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 very good uh, bad with that. And then at the end of that year, uh, we came back and, and and this whole Bobby thing was just going ballistic. And, uh, and then we had the Tri Nations. And yes, they brought in Huffy the Toy. They brought in Dave van Hushlin. Total uh, also came from um, injury. He came in again. And uh, and yes, we had a very bad uh, Tri Nations, especially away. And I remember it was after the, 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 the All Black game, I think it was a Targo, where Mallet basically told Gary, you're out of here, you know? And, uh, and, and he had to still prove himself fighting back from a knee injury, to be on the field with the Sharks, you know? It was just such a tough... Uh, and, and what people don't realize is we stopped playing on, the, say, the, the 13th of December, okay? And we only had about two weeks off, then you had to be back at preseason, so there was no rest. The rugby was taking its toll. And I think if, if 
everybody knows it was the wrong uh, decision, but but I believe Solly had a big part to play in that because he wanted his wonder kid Bobby uh, to make it, and, and I believe Bobby would have had all the qualities to make it, but that was a total, total wrong timing, and it cost us as a team. And what was interesting with Finny, with, 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 and that's why I believe a guy like Nick Mallard is a bit of OCD, because the previous year, John Hart, or in 1996, John Hart, well, I was just thinking that it was 95, and then it was 96. He played with Frank Bunce and these guys, and he just kept on too long with them. He just he just right. didn't bring that new era guys through. And then he took a big, big hiding with us in 98, because he, he was on that Carlos Spencer murders. He was on that, which any team's natural. You're going to have a bit of an undeciding time, but it takes time to settle. But, and he was afraid of that, where he waited too long. Yeah, yeah. And he tried to make that change, but he needed four years for that change to 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 to, to actually uh, get, get cemented. And then a great example for that, uh, Peter de Villiers made the same mistake. Peter de Villiers, in after the the, the he would have won the World Cup. I'm telling you, I rate that as a coach. But after the Lions series, when Monet kicked that kick over, he should have said, "Victor, fantastic, my friend. Here's your retirement package. See you later, John Smith. Here's your retirement package. See you later. I always have the right." to still bring you guys back, okay, and, and, and use you. But I believe this is the new era. You had two years to cement them. And that's where Nick really uh, uh, was solid behind him. It started in 98. Obviously, we had the World Cup. And, 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 and yes, the World Cup was an amazing time. But there was never the unity that we needed. He did a great thing by picking US. But there was just so much, not a cent. No, it was just never that... The trust was broken, and I, I, I always remember two, two years later, I was uh, we were in Corin Co. Now, if you ask any Springbok, okay, so I'm going to say one name. What do you remember? It was your, and if they say Corin Co, the guys all go like this. Ooh, don't say that again. It was the toughest, toughest, toughest fitness session I've ever had in my whole life because it was the whole thing. And I remember driving from there. And the one uh, guy looked at me after and he says, fucking, he's a doos. I said, what do you mean? He says, Nick Mallet. And it was a guy that would have died for Nick Mallet. And the guys just weren't willing to do it anymore because they didn't trust him. And that was the sad thing what he did because in 99, we really had, you know, Flecky was coming through, Bobby was coming through. There was corner, all the guys that were on the edges, but they didn't, deserve, I don't think he ever deserved, but they, they didn't earn the right to go and play that World Cup. And uh, and that was unf- and, and, and it left uh, it left a mark on us. But we talked about it the other day. If you look back at all the fun things, I remember we lost that game, and it was also you know a bit of a fluke. And yeah, it was a good game. So, you, but you feel so so your responsibility for your country is so important. And the next minute, uh, uh, we were watching the French game against the All Blacks, and we were all lying in our rooms. About the semi-final. Okay. Yeah, yeah, watching the semi-final, and the next minute, you just hear, you just heard the, the doors. And the excitement and the oak screaming, and the, when that game final whistle blew, you just heard all the doors going, We're playing the fucking All Blacks, guys. Yeah, and you just had a whole new challenge because we were playing the All Blacks, you know. So, yeah, we lost, and, and I believe it, it was a good Australian side. Anybody playing the French, I think, would have beaten them. But uh, yes, the fact that we could play the All Blacks and then at least beat them, you know, gave it a bit of a better uh, feeling. Uh, for that one, and then we had obviously we had the best post-match function after the World Cup final. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that work. <laughs> that was after that they changed the post-match functions after the World Cup final because that you just cannot allow the second, uh, the third, and the fourth team playoff teams to drink for four days and arrive at a function. <laughs> It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. I think the All Blacks had lost Tana among uh, that one lock of theirs with the hair that always got the conquador. Maxwell was lying past that on the table. We were tearing its other shirts off. So, so it may be a good thing came out of 99. They changed the way the, the, the trophy gets handed over. Talking about talking yeah, about parts. Yeah, sorry. I, I know I know you got to finish, no, Brenda, but we've got four. I think you you can maybe deal this one in four minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Tell, tell us about the the party that sorted things out at that World Cup, which is in Glasgow. I remember yeah. you telling me that it was after you played Spain or something, and you said to me, "There's nothing that Red Bull and vodka can't sort out." And it, <laughs> and it, sort you out. it was after that game, and we had a, we it was I think we were still in Glasgow. We as a team got together, and, and and at that stage everything wasn't right because you know we you know. 
we, were, we didn't enjoy Bobby and what he was doing and how they were allowing him uh, stuff and, 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 and how they, it was just, uh, and we sat there and we had won the game and we had a, a team meeting and, and the team meetings then you had your contiki and you drank a lot of beer and eventually the coaches and them left and the guys just sat there and said, yes, guys, you know what, you know, we can just as well have a full go here and have a go. And we started drinking that night. Oh, it was frightening. I remember Andre Finta. He doesn't say much, but when he starts going, uh, he's also like, and everybody has to sing with you, otherwise he washes your head with beer. You know, then you know it was a good night. And uh, there's a beautiful story of Andre Fenter as well. Uh, just before uh, 2001, we were in a place in Cape Town. Yes, but you must be careful with this info. It was, uh, it was called uh, like the Coyote Adley. Just, just you you the know Coyote. you're on video, Oli. Oli. We don't, we don't even cut video. you out. So just <laughs> like... <laughs> So Andre Fenter says, listen, yeah. Uh, so we go out for a beer. So he goes out with Aljohan Ackerman. He's sitting there. And about 10 o'clock, he says, come, come, Akis. That's what I used to. But there was a screen behind which they would have people dancing. So Aki says, no, man, relax. Two o'clock, I'll be dancing there behind the screen. <laughs> so what happens? They're sitting there and they're having a couple of beers. And uh, truth God, he says, two o'clock, he just feels the tap on his shoulder. And he looks at me as Andre said, the street, he would dance. <laughs> like he says, he was up with a light behind him and he danced. I remember I was still half past three. I got into the lift and I walked into the lift at the same time with them and with my wife, Mariska, here. And you can see they actually had a good time. So, so whenever you got Andre to let loose, it was always a good thing for the team because he was, he, was, he was a serious guy, but that, that drinking session there in Scotland, and it's not, I don't believe the drinking session is, it's not about the drinking, it's about just sitting and, and, and connecting with people, you know what I'm saying, and you have a couple of beers, you drop, you say, you know what guys, I want to be better, but we, and the guys say, but because we all had a common goal, we wanted to make our country proud, and that was a, I think that was the thing about that, you're so sad because you had this massive expectation and we couldn't, deliver you know and, and everybody felt we had to deliver and there was that urgency and uh, luckily uh, we managed to uh, beat the all blacks which works always for redemption <laughs>